Brazil is bracing for what could be its deadliest month yet in the pandemic. Veículos de imprensa uniam forças em suas redações. Then again, there are calls for a national lockdown. The Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro continues to play down the threat. O governo federal impõe um destaque da informação correta. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Brazil, COVID-19, and misinformation. Too much of it comes from the president's office, and a consortium of news organizations is out to change the narrative. Putting a happy face on a genocide, a case of colorizing Cambodian history gone wrong. It was the unlikeliest experiment in harnessing the power of online collaboration, and it's just turned 20 years old. How does Wikipedia do it? Plus, Americans aren't just getting vaccinated, they're making a big song and dance about it. Mr. Biden, bring my vaccine. COVID-19 deaths in Brazil are now at record highs. Intensive care units are beyond their breaking points. Hospitals have been overwhelmed. But that is not the story that the country's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has been telling. He remains a stubborn coronavirus skeptic, continues to downplay the scale of this pandemic, question the science, and push misinformation on face masks and now vaccines. Faced with a government whose official data they cannot trust, some of Brazil's largest media organizations have set aside their competitive differences. They formed a consortium to counter the president's COVID messaging to ensure that Brazilians get the facts that they need to protect themselves against the virus. The president, however, is undeterred. Some major media players remain in his corner, and he has online platforms at his disposal, Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp included, where he can continue to spread his COVID misinformation. Our starting point this week is Latin America's biggest media market, in Brazil. When Brazilians turn to the most watched news program in the country, Vacina, sim. go to their news site of choice, Vacina, sim. or just try to catch up on their favorite football team, they get injected with a simple, potentially life-saving message. Vacina, sim. Yes to the vaccine. Globo as a company, as did uh, other media companies decided to include in, it, in its main news transmission the campaign vaccine, yes. Not to be against the government itself, but to show that we are pro-science, pro-education, pro-vaccine. This campaign has the participation of journalists, columnists, TV presenters, celebrities, and in a very diverse group in terms of age, race, and gender. To try to convince people to get vaccinated in this time where there are conspiracy theories and that even from the government, we can receive messages that are at least ambiguous about the vaccination. So that's why every night more than 40, 50 million Brazilians can see this campaign going on along with the official figures, the numbers of the pandemic that day in the country. The pro-vaccine campaign is part of a collective cooperative effort from Brazilian media outlets that are usually too busy competing with each other to work together. Last June, faced with President Jair Bolsonaro's skepticism of the virus, his refusal to face the facts over the dangers of the pandemic, those outlets formed a consortium. The country's biggest newspaper, Folha de São Paulo, combined forces with seven other major news outlets to provide Brazilians with the information they were not getting from the federal authorities. Job one, to get around the Bolsonaro government's manipulation of the data. Cases, hospitalizations, death rates, to get to the real numbers. The main media outlets in Brazil, which includes Folha Globo, o Estado de São Paulo, uh, Extra Newspaper, uh, G1 site, we formed this consortium to get the data direct from the, the main sources, the people who are registering in hospitals or they were signing the 
the death certificates. What the consortium did was to contact uh, governors and um, the health uh, secretaries in different uh, states of Brazil and get the data from them to build a database that could be used um, at any time by any uh, media outlet, not depending on the government. Desire to talk to the press, just uh, grab the data from uh, each city and each state instead of uh, waiting for um, President Bolsonaro to speak about it. The government's fudging of the numbers, its selective use of the data, and timing official news releases to minimize potentially critical news coverage all contribute to Brazil's misinformation problem. On COVID-19, President Bolsonaro has made Donald Trump look like a realist. Abaixo de 40 anos, quase ninguém contrai ou se contrai assintomático. Para que esse pavor todo? A vida tem que continuar. He and his supporters on social media have long doubted the dangers of the virus. He infamously called it a little flu and has resisted calls for a national lockdown to limit the spread. Bolsonaro has taken a similar tack on vaccines, once again questioning the expertise of scientists in his own way. Na Pfizer, está bem claro lá no contrato, nós não nos responsabilizamos por qualquer efeito colateral. Se você virar o... Uh, of course, it's a joke, but you know he he is planting the doubt about the the safety of the vaccines. He would put down the vaccine all the time, and he would uh, ask people, "Oh, are you taking the Chinese vaccine because this will change your genes and things like this?" But the fact is very clear and the vaccines are safe. There is also a strong discourse against lockdown and social distancing, usually stressing the false dichotomy between saving the economy or saving lives. And social media plays a big part in that. Mainly white, rich Brazilians claiming they're protecting the economy go on motorcades inside their big cars to protest against social isolation and lockdown. Bolsonaro rode social media to the president's office. He spent more time during his 2018 election campaign on Facebook and WhatsApp communicating directly with voters than he devoted to powerhouse broadcasters like Global, which is now part of the COVID consortium. The president does have his backers on the airwaves, on channels like Record and SBT. Record and SBT, um, they are uh, the second and the third most watched TV channels in the country, and they talk to uh, lower income population. As restrições para tentar conter o coronavírus provocaram um efeito perverso. A pobreza triplicou no Brasil. Record is mainly a uh, evangelical TV channel, and they have been receiving lots of money from the government for a long time now. They are just uh, fulfilling the duty to, to make funders happy. They are amplifying the federal government message, blaming local authorities who are defending social distance and some degree of lockdowns. O governo, o Ministério da Saúde são depreciados constantemente pela oposição e por parte da imprensa que não tem reconhecido a verdadeira importância do trabalho que está sendo And because we have presidential elections next year, this is very serious because uh, Bolsonaro has to answer for his deeds. And I wonder how long it's going to take for TV channels to notice that you, you shouldn't uh, be supporting anything that is taking people towards death. Including some of their own like the SBT news anchor in Belo Horizonte, who had this to say in December when urged by his local mayor to stay home for Christmas. I don't agree with you, I'm going to visit my father, I'm going to visit my mother, I'm not going to kill He died in January, killed by COVID-19. It is far easier to sow doubts about a pandemic and related vaccines than it is to properly inform people. And that initially gave Bolsonaro and his supporters a leg up online. Things have since changed on the social media side of the debate. Scientists have moved into that space. Achilla Yamarino, 
Margaret Daucom, and Natalia Pastarnak have all become household names in Brazil, finding huge audiences, racking up millions of views. What has not changed is the reluctance of social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter to intervene against misinformation. Bolsonaro has been a great influencer on social media. And, uh, and when I say a great, and I mean a bad actor, right? Uh, he has been using his Facebook Lives. He does one every Thursday, one hour long. Millions and millions of people watch it. We have researched all his Facebook Lives and between January and February, he could have been punished by Facebook at least 29 times for spreading mis and disinformation regarding COVID-19. Once in a while, we see Twitter taking out one of Bolsonaro's posts. It happened already. But uh, most of the time, he has really a free space to say whatever he wants. They should be acting much more. There are lots of crimes being committed on a daily basis by the president and his supporters. A government that refuses to play it straight. Social media giants that have chosen to shirk their responsibilities, and mainstream news outlets that go well beyond holding power to account. They're effectively doing the Bolsonaro government's job, telling Brazilians what they need to know. Journalism doesn't get any bigger than that, saving lives in a country that has lost far too many. This past week has seen a lot of discussion around the practice of photo colorization. That's taking black and white still images from the past and restoring them digitally, adding color. Nick Muirhead has been following a story about a news outlet that's published those kinds of images and landed in hot water. That's right. So colorizing images has become popular because you can take a photograph that's 100 years old and make it look like it was taken yesterday. So it's a powerful tool in terms of bringing history to life. Last week, US news outlet Vice published a series by an Irish artist named Matt Lockery who specializes in this kind of thing. He colorized and restored photos of prisoners from the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia. That's the brutal dictatorship led by Pol Pot uh, between 1975 and 1979, which killed an estimated 1.7 million people. But it soon emerged that Lockery had not only colorized the images, but he had also made it look like the prisoners who are essentially sitting in a death camp, he made it look like they were smiling and happy. What makes matters worse is that at the time of publication, Vice didn't disclose that the images had been doctored. How did Cambodians catch on to this? Was Lockery's work just unconvincing? Well, as you can see, they are convincing. They look realistic, but it's not as though the original images were obscure. In fact, they are on display in a genocide museum in Phnom Penh. So Cambodians figured it out very quickly and they went on social media and they posted the originals alongside the doctored images to show the difference. So Vice has since taken that article down and they've also taken down a, a series from last month which also featured Lockery's work. This time he colorized and added artificial smiles to a group of female prisoners in Australia from the 1920s. But Cambodia, we're talking about a genocide. How has Lockery defended his work? We haven't seen anything since this has all emerged, but at the time of publication, he gave an interview and he said that that's how he found the images. He even tried to offer up some explanations for why the prisoners might be smiling. He said that they could be nervous, they could be trying to appease their captors. Um, but I think what really summed up the feeling in Cambodia came from the director of the Documentation Center of Cambodia. He called Lockery's work a grave injustice to a piece of living history and asked, how can you change hell to happiness? I guess you can try to do it digitally, but it won't always work. Thanks, Nick. 20 years ago, a website emerged in a quiet corner of the World Wide Web. Very few people would have noticed it. Fewer would have predicted it would ever prove useful to them. In the two decades since, Wikipedia has grown into one of the Internet's top destinations. The English language site alone averages about 190 million visits per day. Our information universe has grown marred by alternative facts, poisoned by conspiracy theories, disinformation. So how has a free online encyclopedia built through crowdsourcing, open editing and volunteers managed 
to maintain its relevance and preserve its credibility. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the inner workings of Wikipedia. January 5th, 2020. A Wikipedia user creates a new article. 2019-2020, China pneumonia outbreak. It's just one new entry in an online encyclopedia that averages 602 new articles every day on its English language site alone. That article would grow and its title would change. Today, thousands of edits later, buttressed by references to nearly 750 external articles, from medical journals to news outlets, Wikipedia's COVID-19 page has been viewed 88 million times. It's a perfect illustration of how Wikipedia works. Someone somewhere starts an article, and then many minds in multiple countries jump on it, adding, deleting, debating, and ultimately refining what we know about a subject. Those editors, most of whom are anonymous, are called Wikipedians. There have been surveys uh, about who these editors are, and it turns out it varies quite a bit, from retirees to students to experts to somebody who just had a hobby or someone who came across an article and just fixed the, the grammar of the sentence. A common theme that emerges is the willingness to contribute to something bigger than themselves. Wikipedia has nearly 300,000 contributors who add to its articles on a monthly basis. And we're very invested in this idea of knowledge integrity, that information should be accurate and well cited, and that it can change over time. As an example of this, our knowledge about this pandemic changed on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And Wikipedia's open model allowed for us to continue to integrate information, update it as it changed in sort of this living record of the world. Wikipedia's English language site is by far the biggest and best known, but there are Wikipedias in 300 other languages. There's also Wiktionary, a multilingual dictionary, Wikidata, a storehouse of analyzable databases, and Wikimedia Commons, a library of images, videos, and music that are free to use. All of these are managed by the Wikimedia Foundation, a San Francisco based nonprofit that has two primary sources of funding, sizable grants and endowments from philanthropic organizations and thousands of small contributions from the public. The foundation has around 450 paid employees. The thousands of other Wikimedians are all unpaid volunteers. All of that information can be found on Wikipedia itself. But what if the information is inaccurate on this page or on any other? What if somebody edited the page incorrectly, someone who's misinformed, or a person with an agenda? How do Wikipedia's volunteer editors know when something needs their attention? We asked one of them. Wikipedia has done quite well in building tools or features that allow us to track and keep an eye on things. We have a recent changes feed that when you visit, in real time, you see all the edits that are happening. We have people who look at those things and find tasks and things to fix. We also have watch lists where if there is a particular page you care about and you're interested in keeping an eye on, you put it on your watch list. So any change that is made to that page, you are informed. And there are some specific pages on Wikipedia that are particularly prone to being changed. The ones on contentious topics, like the 2003 Iraq war, the American president who started that war, George W. Bush, Scientology, Adolf Hitler, abortion, and many others. What these issues have in common is a huge amount of public interest, many conflicting perspectives, and they can often trigger furious edit wars, with people in different parts of the world adding, deleting, contesting, and reinstating elements in the articles, all within the span of just a few hours. What we see on sort of any topic, whether we're talking about Kashmir or Crimea or the West Bank, is really a conversation that uh, pulls people across different perspectives and brings them into negotiation about what are the facts of the case and how do we even describe what is considered controversial. There are a number of principles that all the editors and contributors are asked to sign on to. For example, all points of view should be expressed in a reliable and neutral way, and they should be honestly represented. There should be 
multiple sources of facts. And there should be facts about opinions, but no opinions expressed themselves. It's a collaboration to get some of these things sorted out. It's not just left for one person to come like a judge and just you know, declare who is guilty or who is right and whatnot. Usually, the starting point is the policy. Has someone edited in a way that departs from the guideline? Then those conversations start. There is tremendous power in the community of Wikipedia editors. They have the power to make decisions around what's in and what's out. And so what this means in practice is that you don't just get the right to sort of walk into Wikipedia and write whatever you want on the site. You have to learn how the policies work. You have to make contributions that are high quality. And if someone comes along as a troll who is introducing bad information to the site or what we call vandalism, the community has the right to just kick you out. Vandalism on Wikipedia ranges from the petty, such as college kids writing frivolous articles about themselves, to more serious misdemeanors, like writing lies into biographies, uploading shock images onto pages, or the rare instances when someone manages to delete an entire article. It isn't easy to do, but it happened in July 2015, when someone wiped out the entry on Donald Trump, who was then a presidential candidate, and left a single line. Let's be fair, nobody cares about him. Wikipedia strives to reflect the people who use it, which is not the same as reflecting society at large, so, it faces an underrepresentation problem. On its English language site, only one out of five biographies are about women, and just 2% of articles are about Africa, a continent that is home to close to 20% of the world's population. That, in large part, comes down to the makeup of its volunteer editors. In 2011, a survey was conducted across the Wikipedias in various languages. 91% of the respondents were male. You know, it takes someone from a certain community, a certain country, a certain culture, of a certain sexual orientation, a certain gender, to realize that there's a gap in the knowledge that he or she is consuming. So if Wikipedia doesn't bring everybody on board, those gaps remain in the content that we have out. So it has been important that women are brought on board, and it's not just women. Emer people from emerging communities are all brought on board. Um, we make them comfortable enough to edit, and yeah, basically that problem gets solved. Widening its pool of volunteers is a critical first step. So Wikipedians around the world arrange themed editathons, meetups where people interested in specific subjects or representing specific groups can come together to understand what and how they can contribute to Wikipedia. So we're just trying to um, make it known that there should be more women who are involved in editing Wikipedia, but also the content should reflect a larger population, which includes women. The remarkable thing about Wikipedia is how much of it is not controversial, how much of it is just basic history that everybody agrees upon. It used to be difficult and uh, burdensome to go find answers to some simple questions. But this is pretty easy. Think about it. Billions of people have access to information now. That's amazing. That wasn't possible two decades ago. We came along at the right time in the early days of the internet, and this idea of free knowledge for all proved to be something that was really compelling. The idea of access to factual information presented without bias that can be critical of power is something quite radical. And so Wikipedia is both a tool in our pockets and we don't necessarily think much of, and it's also something that is a truly powerful, radical act uh, in defense of free information and in defense of this idea that we should all be able to access what we need in order to understand the world around us. And finally, humankind is about one week away from a vaccination milestone. One billion coronavirus vaccine doses administered worldwide. Mind you, that only represents full vaccination for about 6% of the global population, and even that is concentrated in a handful of rich countries. Large parts of Asia and Africa still have no access to the vaccines. The U.S. is moving fast. At the start of 2021, just 1% of Americans had been vaccinated. Today, that figure stands at 
And President Biden aims to get all Americans at least one dose by the beginning of May. He has a lot of skeptics on his hands, though, who will need convincing. For some Americans, like singer and satirist Randy Rainbow, herd immunity cannot come quickly enough. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. You now say we'll have enough supply for every adult to be vaccinated by May. Does this mean I can go to Cancun for spring break with Ted Cruz and the gals? Well, I didn't say that. Mr. Biden, bring my vaccine. Keep me protected from COVID-19. Tell me the trick to how I might earn a fix of that magic Pfizer or Moderna. Biden, give me a poke. They call you sleepy, but you're pretty woke. I'm so tired of quarantine. Mr. Biden, bring my vaccine. Oh, Mr. Biden, kick up a notch. Cause I've run out of Netflix movies to watch. Girl, I'm so tired of quarantine.